I'm Reggie Turner, president of the American Bar Association. Welcome to the Law Day 2022 virtual program toward a more perfect union, the constitution and times of change. Our Law Day theme encourages everyone to consider the promises of the United States Constitution and the role that each of us plays in making those ideals a reality. I hope today's panel discussion provides opportunities for you to engage with this theme, think about it substantively, and have conversations in your community about it. Our national constitution is a dynamic document. It's a plan for government, but it also delegates power, articulates rights, and offers mechanisms for change. It has never been perfect, but we the people, through legislation, court rulings, and amendments, have worked across generations to attempt to form a more perfect union. We've seen these efforts in action, especially in recent years during this ongoing pandemic. Citizens raise their voices loud as ever to fulfill the promises of the Constitution. The 2022 Law Day theme toward a more perfect union, the Constitution in times of change, reminds us that defining and refining those words might be our oldest national tradition. Each of us has a responsibility to help the United States become a more perfect union. So thank you for your participation this Law Day, which will officially be recognized on Sunday, May 1, 2022. You can find additional opportunities to celebrate Law Day and explore the theme throughout the month of May on the Law Day page at www.lawday.org. Let me thank the Law Librarian of Congress, Azlehan Balut, for her partnership on today's event. We also thank National Law Day Chair Orlando Lucero, as well as the moderator and panelists for today's program. I hope you enjoy the discussion. Good afternoon and thank you all for being with us today. My name is Aslan Bulut. I'm the Law Librarian of Congress and I'm very pleased to welcome the American Bar Association's National Law Day Chair, Orlando Lucero. Orlando, thank you for joining us for this virtual interview and helping us kick off the celebration of Law Day. So this year marks the 65th anniversary of National Law Day commemorations. Can you please remind our audience what Law Day is and why it's important? Uh, absolutely. It is wonderful to be here with you on this virtual interview. And I'm very sorry that we can't actually be doing this in person at the Law Library of Congress today. Uh, again, let me just introduce myself briefly. My name is Orlando Lucero and I am from Albuquerque, New Mexico. And it's my privilege and honor to serve as this year's ABA National Law Day uh, Chair. Um, that's, I've been very active in the ABA since I first started practicing in the early 80s. And this has been a wonderful opportunity for me this year. But getting on to your question, a Law Day is held annually on May 1st. And it is a national day first established by President Eisenhower in 1958 and three years later by Congress uh, to celebrate the rule of law, to celebrate the rule of law here in the United States. And Law Day provides an opportunity for people across the country, not just lawyers, to understand how law and the legal process works to protect our liberty, to strive for justice, and contribute to the freedoms that we all as Americans share. In past years, recent themes have included advancing the rule of law now, which focused on individual responsibility to advance the rule of law, and free speech, free press, free society, which focused on the critical role of free speech and free press as a foundation for our democracy. So the theme for this year's Law Day is toward a more perfect union, the Constitution in times of change. What does this theme mean to you? So as we worked with ABA President Reggie Turner last summer on the theme, uh, like good lawyers who try to be precise in their language, we tried to create a statement that embodied the times in which we live and that was also dynamic. The word toward 
which defines this year's theme, is quite intended. That word carries multiple connotations. The word itself suggests movement, not something static. It also suggests that we have the opportunity to continue to move forward to a place that is more perfect than what it is now. In a broader sense, the theme means to me that the Constitution is a resilient document that works to address the issues in our country as our country changes. It has been amended 27 times, but never completely rewritten or redrawn. Uh, through interpretation by the Supreme Court, the Constitution continues to evolve and continues to be a living document and continues to be the longest standing constitution of any democracy in our world. I believe that the Constitution affords our country and our citizens the best path forward for our democracy, and that in our current polarizing times, we all need to rally around the Constitution precisely to help us navigate these rough seas of change that we face. So how do, how do you view the theme? How did you react to the theme? Thank you, Orlando. Um, so as you've already stated, indeed, the Constitution is a dynamic document and that delegates power, articulates rights, and offers mechanisms for change. It's not perfect and it's definitely not finished, but it is a wonderful frame, a guidance that we can and should build upon. Our uh, founders created a document embodying a vision of the government that was truly ahead of its time, something very remarkable, but times do change fast and we need to learn how to catch up with those changes uh, by introducing new rules, new laws, and expanding the original notion of we the people. So I believe that the whole nature of our country is that we recognize we are flawed and when we are flawed, uh, we aim to improve those imperfections. So the tasks of building a more perfect union, a better and stronger society, providing and protecting human rights and fundamental freedoms are rooted in the dignity and equality inherent in all human beings. So I'm going to move on then to our next uh, question. Um, what can learning about law on Law Day contribute to civic life in the United States? I think at a minimum, it is a small step in trying to create a more educated populace in terms of what our government is, what our representative democracy is, what the branches of government are, and how those branches of government relate to one another. You know, what does the rule of law mean? Why does it matter? I fear that the level of civics knowledge that is taught today is woefully inadequate to prepare our students to understand their future role as citizens and to understand the role of government. Our schools today face so many challenges that were unknown to probably your generation and my generation. Growing up, the last thing I had to worry about was a school shooting. <laughs> but there are now today so many demands being placed on our educational system and not everything can get priority. And I feel that the area of civics education is one of those areas wh whose priority has slipped. And, but whatever the reasons, you know, I fear that if our students don't learn history, don't learn government, don't learn civics, they will not have the knowledge and critical thinking tools to evaluate potential future attacks on our way of government. They won't have the tools necessary to understand what is truth and what is not. So while Law Day cannot fix all of these ills, obviously, it is a great opportunity for adults and for students all across the country to come together on and around Law Day to learn, or I would say even relearn, the important foundational concepts of our democracy. And I hope to 
together uh, share a new sense of renewed hope. Very well put. Um, so my response to this question was um, more about very much aligned with what you've said. Um, we do learn about our rights and responsibilities as citizens and learning about law strengthens Americans knowledge of our principles of constitutional governance and democracy. Uh, it also aims to educate the public on how the legal profession and system works as a whole. It uh, stimulates appreciation and critical thinking about the founding f fundamentals that um, so easily can be taken for granted. And the goal of Law Day itself is to celebrate the role of law in everyday life and in society. So without a public knowledgeable of the practices, institutions, and attitudes that support constitutional democracy, maintaining the commitments of both law and democracy obviously becomes much more difficult. So civic education uh, depends on knowledge of basic institutions established under the law of constitution. And at the Supreme Court Fellows Lecture, we hosted um, actually Justice Breyer yesterday. Uh, he pulled his pocket constitution from his suit ja jacket and stated that basically it is a boundary setting document and one that leaves most things up to the public to decide by democratic processes. And he said, if you don't participate, this document won't work. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the roles of law librarians is to ensure access to authentic legal information resources, not only to legal professionals and practitioners, but also to the greater community. So my colleagues in the law library uh, help our public patrons understand law and teach them how to seek their own remedies to identify and protect their rights. And we try to provide a, a perfect combination of resources and services, and hopefully a, a good introduction to the legal system. So our next uh, question, Orlando, is about um, what motivated you to become an attorney and what is one of your most significant experiences that you've had during your career in the practice of law? Well, that's a good question for me. And in, in all honesty, I have to say that I am one of those attorneys who fell more into the role than actively aspiring to it my whole life. Um, there were no attorneys in my family and in my small hometown, I think there were only two attorneys. So I had no attorney uh, around me in any way, shape or form. Although, even though uh, neither my father nor my mother completed college, uh, they were very strong believers in education and encouraged me to study hard, get good grades, and succeed. Uh, but interestingly, my father, um, who was just a mid-level civil servant uh, in the federal government, always wanted me to be a lawyer. And growing up in the Watergate era, I started to see for myself what lawyers could do and how lawyers could help ensure the rule of law. And so as time went on, I became more interested in pursuing a legal career and uh, ultimately, I was very fortunate to have many choices for law school, and I chose uh, Stanford Law School, which I think helped prepare me very well for my, my future career. It's hard to define for me what is the most significant experience, uh, let alone a, you know, the most significant experience. Um, in my day job, I work in the title insurance business. I am a regional counsel for my company. And a lot of my day job involves working on large, complex commercial real estate transactions, and primarily in the alternative energy section. So I do a lot of wind farms, solar farms, that kind of thing. And I recently had the good fortune of seeing the completion of the largest wind farm in North America and one of the largest electric transmission lines. And I feel like I had a very important part to play in getting that transaction over the finish line. And while those are very significant to me, they are not 
significant in the same way as you know this following little story that I wish to share with everyone today. Um, I try to take uh, on a regular basis pro bono cases from the New Mexico Legal Aid Office. And uh, over the years, I have worked with many uh, clients, primarily on real estate matters. And I often try to work with clients whose primary language or maybe only language is Spanish. So about two years ago, I accepted a case for a Hispanic woman who lived in a house that she actually owned. She was you know, making her mortgage payments, but it was her own home, not a rental. She worked uh, mostly as a home health care aide, which I think we recognize is not a job that pays a whole lot of money. Her home was quite old, uh, needed lots of repairs. And this is where the story gets really a much more moving. She had no running water. She did not have a working stove. She did not have a working uh, refrigerator. She basically got water from her hose outside and if she needed to heat water, she heated it on a hot plate um, in her home. Um, so, so what started all of this is that she was cited by the municipal authorities for numerous code violations and her home was set to be condemned. And as is the case with many of these kinds of situations, you know, this woman made ends sort of meet with her job, but then her car broke down. She couldn't repair it and she lost her job. So when I took the case, I was, I was mostly very concerned about what I really would be able to do for her. Um, but it also seemed so unfair to me that this woman could be hum homeless and that she deserved at least a fighting chance to keep her home. And while I could elaborate for a long time about the various steps um, I had to take to try to help her, um, the bottom line is that after many different administrative hearings, after helping her through a Chapter 7 bankruptcy proceeding, and helping her connect with a variety of social service agencies uh, that could help her acquire and install appliances, she was finally able to um, bring her home up to code and she was ultimately able to stay in the house. And for me, you know, I work with multi-billion dollar companies every day, but the satisfaction I got from helping this particular woman really far outweighs that. And I was very, very happy that I was actually able to get the exact result she wanted. Um, I feel very lucky. Oh, I'm not, so, you know, Aslan, you obviously have a very, very interesting uh, day job yourself. And what motivated you to become a lawyer? Um, so I, oh, I wanted to react to what you shared. That was quite moving and, and remarkable. And I'm sure that is, an, a, you know, a client that will stay with you um, for the rest of your life, which which I think for many of us going into the profession, uh, really following one's ideals. And um, for me, uh, you know, law librarianship and, and my recent appointment to this particular position, uh, which is only since August, by the way, um, I, I cannot emphasize enough uh, the great honor and and truly distinct privilege to serve as as the law librarian of Congress. We do here have quite an unrivaled collection, a very unique status, and a, truly a team of the most dedicated and experienced colleagues um, as an you know exemplar library. Um, so you know it's it's a dream come true for me in many ways and I, I truly do look forward to advancing the law library's mission with um, utmost dedication and reverence so the, the law library's mission and and my goal um, is to continue providing these authoritative legal research and reference as well as instruction services and access to this amazing collection of not just US but foreign comparative and inter international law. And our vision is to achieve global awareness of those very resources. 
Um, and so that is quite a hefty uh, mission. We obviously assist Congress, uh, executive agencies, and the judiciary. In fact, uh, we are the only uh, Library of Congress unit to serve all three branches of government, and, and we also assist the public. And in order to achieve that, my focus is, uh, has been on modernizing our operations, uh, improving our outreach, and implementing a long-term digitization strategy to increase access to the law library's vast collections, um, products, and services. So one of my goals is uh, also to increase uh, use of the, the materials that are in the public domain um, for US and legal and legislative materials, not only online, but only also available commercially. So, you know, to, to enable the public to access these resources um, freely. Uh, when the pandemic affected our operations, the law library uh, quickly and quite successfully adapted to that changing environment uh, with a focus on, on creating, improving, and enriching uh, the multiple online resources we had and on making our collections and services available to the patrons. So in early 2020, we launched the Legal Research Institute, which is the law library's virtual platform to create, uh, consolidate, and promote the law library's in-person and webinar-based courses, presentations, classes, trainings, and events, such as this one. And during the pandemic, the Legal Research Institute became users' one-stop location for all law library educational offerings. So webinars experienced a surge in attendance after shutdowns caused users to perform research from home. And all of our webinars, you can find out much more about all of them and our projects and events uh, by um, going on to the Law Library's news and events and signing up for the email list on uh, loc.gov, so loc.gov slash subscribe or visiting our Law Library's Legal Research Institute page at law.gov. So all research and reference staff of the Law Library were able to perform all duties without interruption on site and remotely. Working primarily remotely, the law library staff prepared 383 legal research reports for Congress. They responded to 444 reference inquiries from members of Congress and provided almost 9,000 research and reference responses to other Library of Congress users. And in June of last year, the Law Library reopened its reading room to researchers and, and we provide services to over 100 researchers every month. So, so I wanted uh, to- hey, If I may yeah, just please. react to that a little bit, please. I have to say, um, I have a certain fondness for the Law Library of Congress because back when I was an undergrad in college, uh, one summer in the mid-70s, I um, interned for our Senator Pete Domenici, who was then one of the senators from New Mexico. And uh, one of the projects I worked on that summer involved research around what now we would call um, energy conservation and energy projects. How do we, Remembering that this was in the middle of the gas crisis in the 70s, and uh, politicians were starting to look at ways in which to try to wean us from our energy independence. And I remember I worked on a project that summer that was trying to identify resources around ways to conserve energy and such. And so I ended up spending a good chunk of my summer there at the Law Library of Congress. And, and it was very interesting. Wasn't, and, and of course we had to do it the old fashioned way, uh, you know, the analog way, you know. <laughs> through the card catalog and other resources and talking to the librarians, but, but it was very interesting and it was amazing the kind of information that was available. So uh, I have that fondness. Uh. That's wonderful. Uh, we hope we could leave such impression on all of our both on-site and, and virtual patrons. Uh, we try to provide really, um, I, I do want to say uh, impeccable service to all who you know reach out to us for any legal research assistance. Um, 
So Orlando, I wanted to ask how has the pandemic impacted the practice of law and not just for legal professionals, but also for clients, particularly as it concerns access to justice? Well, you know, I guess that could question, the answer to that question could probably take us through the rest of our, uh, <laughs> of our allotted time here today. Um, but for me, for example, I've been working remotely since March 11th, 2020. So for almost two years, um, I have worked remotely. And um, in, interestingly, I'm going to continue to work remotely. Uh, just this week, uh, my company decided to uh, terminate the lease for the space where you know my office had been. And so I now am going to join the remote workforce uh, on a full-time basis. So we'll see how that goes. So I, I kind of joke that the, the, the pandemic and having to work remotely really did not impact me personally all that much. Uh, other than creating fewer opportunities for me to wear my signature bow tie. <laughs> so I'm I'm really one of the fortunate ones. I can do my job, you know, wherever I have a phone and a laptop and, and good Wi-Fi. Um, so, but so many others uh, are not so lucky. Anyone who has to meet with a client or a customer immediately, uh, they had to figure out how to conduct a business in a closed and masked environment. In the title insurance business where I work, you know, we pivoted uh, almost immediately to drive-by closings that were conducted through the windows of a car. Not exactly the most um, the most uh, ideal uh, situation. And um, a drive-by closing, uh, you know, when you think about it, is relatively easy uh, compared to a lawyer who has to visit his or her incarcerated client to provide effective um, uh, representation. You know, uh, courts were forced to curtail their in-person op um, operations and they didn't have the resources to offer remote access. So it was so difficult for uh, lawyers to be able to effectively communicate, engage with and represent their clients. And, you know, that's really just in the criminal justice system you know, beyond the criminal justice system, uh, you know, the pandemic uh, closures and lack of resources affected things like evictions, workplace discrimination, domestic violence. So, you know, we know that all of those kinds of things increased during the pandemic, yet um, the resources available and the forums available to try to address those issues were severely uh, restricted. And really, uh, even a greater need existed for resources to access justice. Uh, and though, you know, I understand that, like the mother of necessity, in many different uh, agencies and programs, they were able to figure out how to work uh, more closely together and to create initiatives to provide access to programs and to courts. But, you know, that was not available in each and every case. And I think now we are going to have, now that the pandemic is easing and restrictions are being lifted, there is such a backlog, I would say, <laughs> of justice issues that are now going to need to be addressed. So we really have our work cut out for us. That That is a um, good segue to uh, this next uh, question I wanted to ask you. Um, I looked at the ABA's 2021 profile of the legal profession and learned among many figures that one in seven lawyers are a person of color. Only 3% of women of color are partners at big law firms and 80% of federal judges are white. How can we increase diversity in the legal profession? Well, that is the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I have, as, as part of my work in the ABA over about 30 years, a lot of the focus of what I have done is work in the diversity, equity, and inclusion sphere. And, you know, this problem is, you know, quite, quite vexing. Um, many people way smarter than me have been trying to figure this out for a long time, and we yet have not really solved this problem. And one of the things we have to recognize is that this is just an incredibly multi-nuanced problem. You know, part of the challenge is how we define diversity and 
understanding and recognizing that so many different factors come into play depending on the particular diverse category. At the same time, we also uh, recognize the intersectionality of the issue. This question itself is an example, I think, of intersectionality, at least part of the question. We know that fewer women become partners at big law firms. So that's you know kind of part one. But even fewer women of color become partners at those places. So that's the intersection of gender <clears throat> and race coming together to create an even more dismal result for women of color um, in law firms. Now, in my opinion, and one of the root causes here is that the uh, is that the lack of diversity in our profession is the cost of law school. This is one of my pet peeves. Um, but, you know, we've got to be honest here. The cost of higher education has far outpaced uh, outpaced inflation. Excuse me. You know, many students have substantial debt before they start law school and then go into even greater debt to get a law school education. And the resources available to families of color are, gonna, are generally less. So students of color start behind the debt curve even before they get started. Um, so I think that's one of the key issues that we need to focus on. But just talking about um, gender and women a bit, we know that currently there are slightly more women enrolled in law school than men. So I think we can say that there is basically gender parity when students graduate from law school. But then there is no shortage of women really entering the profession, but the data clearly show that women drop out of the legal profession at much higher rates than men. So we are not doing a good job of retaining uh, women who join our profession. And as a result of this attrition, women ultimately only make up 23% of partners and 19% of equity partners in, uh, in large law firms. And many things contribute to this gap between the genders, but part of it is work-life balance, unconscious bias, pay disparities, and I think, you know, law firms and other legal employers really have to very consciously seek to address these factors and other factors, such as the lack of mentors, uh, the lack of client acquisition uh, opportunities to help women succeed more. And so, um, and like I say, that's really just focusing a little bit on uh, the issues that affect women, the issues that affect other diverse communities are equally compelling and there's overlap, but there's difference. So um, I wish someone had uh, the magic answer to this question, but I know that we're all trying hard to fix it. Well, I, I think you captured the key points very well. Definitely highlighted uh, some of the reasons for my own personal career choices in my, in my life. Um, so in closing, um, Orlando, and this has been a great conversation. Um, I wanted to ask, what is a piece of career advice you have for young legal professionals? Well, my, I guess my biggest uh, piece of career advice really is twofold. Um, first, um, find an area or practice that you enjoy. You know, while I think most of us can do work uh, that we don't necessarily like or enjoy for a while, uh, ultimately, doing work that does not sustain you intellectually or emotionally is going to drag you down. I mean, so find something uh, you love. If you can't find something you love, find something you at least like. <laughs> My second piece of advice, however, is, is find great mentors, um, you know, people with whom you connect and whose advice and friendship you trust. And I was very fortunate early in my career to have some great mentors. Uh, including Bob Poole and Roberta Cooper Ramo, who were partners in the law firm I first joined in Albuquerque um, after law school. Um, Bob Poole was an incredibly smart and yet incredibly humble guy. And, you know, really what he instilled in me 
was a deep abiding notion that ethics should always be the forefront of everything that we do, uh, not only as lawyers, but also as, you know, individuals, as human beings. And Roberta Ramo uh, taught me the value of being a lawyer, that the value of being a lawyer really is not just doing uh, excellent legal work, but also serving your community. And throughout my entire legal uh, career, I have tried to serve my local community and my bar community in a variety of different ways. So I have to brag here a little bit. Um, and I tell my daughter, who is a 3L at Yale Law School and is headed to big law in Los Angeles when she finishes school, that it really is perfectly fine to do well and to do good at the same time. Those are not mutually exclusive. You know, and I have also taken to heart and would encourage all lawyers to take to heart the words of Luke and urge my colleagues to do the same because to whom much is given, much will be required. So Aslan, you know, you also get to answer this question as the <laughs> conclusion of our, of, of our conversation here today. What advice would you give to, uh, to young lawyers today? So my, uh, my advice be, be, due to my experience is probably going to um, uh, apply to law librarians or this career more than perhaps lawyers, but um, some of it I, I hope will apply to everyone in any profession really. And that is to, um, you know, don't shortchange yourself. Uh, just recognizing how versatile your degree is. And that is true very much for a JD or an MLS in my, you know, in my case. Uh, and for me, it has given me a career that has been very exciting. I've enjoyed every step along the way. Um, law degree in this field can prepare you for many different career paths beyond traditional. Uh, another obvious uh requirement of our times is, you know, your ability to market yourself. So creating a web presence to promote your abilities, um, the prevalence of electronic and digital information nowadays increases uh, demand for tech savviness. So make sure to obtain and cultivate strong technology skills. Uh, if you can be geographically flexible, you know, I've moved cross country, um, twice in the last three years um, join associations you know American Bar Association you know if you're a lawyer American Library Association uh, American Association of Law Libraries if you're a law librarian and finally which you also touched on was you know finding a mentor so network uh, network network and don't be afraid to ask because if you do not ask, you may not get. <laughs> so start building a support network early on. Uh, you never know who might assist you later in your career. And speaking from my own experience, specializing in a certain field can give you a, you know, your career a real boost. So um, don't think small when it comes to job searching. It'll benefit from some outside of the box thinking and, and don't be afraid to apply for different positions and move from one field to another. Um, that is really how I ended up in the Law Library of Congress. Um, so um, I wanted to thank you, Orlando, uh, for being with us today. It has been a true pleasure talking to you and I'm so glad we were able to offer this interview as a small contribution to our traditional um, celebration of Law Day with the American Bar Association. And of course, thank you to, to the American Bar Association President Reginald M. Turner on this excellent cooperation. I'd also like to use this opportunity to express my gratitude to the ABA's Division for Public Education and the Law Library's outreach staff. Thank you for your dedication and tireless efforts in providing resources and advancing public understanding of law and its role in society. And of course, for arranging and promoting our programs and events. 
And to all of you watching us today, please join the American Bar Association and the Law Library of Congress again on April 28th at 3 p.m. to celebrate Law Day with a webinar-based panel discussion titled Toward a More Perfect Union, the Constitution in Times of Change. So this discussion will explore moments of constitutional change in the United States, especially in more recent years, looking at constitutional amendments as well as social movements that led to legislation, shifts in U.S. Supreme Court jurisprudence, and other indicators of significant legal change. Once again, thank you all for being with us today and happy Law Day.